Hey, hey y'all, I'm, I'm James Wright, Wright and welcome, welcome to my shop. Today we're going to be talking about jointing a board. In other words, how do you get a nice, clean, true edge all the way along the joint of the board? And we're going to be showing it through a couple of different methods, methods a couple of tools, and different ways of doing, doing that. that. Uh, but uh, a little bit of things going, going on in the shop. Um, I'm actually working on a couple projects with a spoon, spoon carving. I'll show you that. Um, and this, this is going to be more than I've been wanting to do for a little while here. here. I'm just, just doing some, uh, some simple, simple spoon carving. carving. So, so those are going to be coming here soon. And every time I do carving, I get people asking, well, where do I find affordable, cheap chisels? And there really aren't any affordable cheap chisels, and that's been a response for a while. Um, but I recently got in a set from Narek that I'm going to be experimenting with. Um, so hopefully in the next, uh, well, maybe Thursday, um, but I'm going to be actually playing with these and giving an idea on um, these chisels. Um, because affordably, they are surprisingly affordable. Um, so that's going to be kind of fun. Um, but also, I just got this. I was given a call from a guy who had his father's tools. Um, he didn't really want them. Uh, so I went and bought a bunch of them. Actually, I bought pretty much everything he had. Um, and one of the things in there was a Stanley 45 in the box. And so I thought I'd show you this because I'm actually going to be selling this um, on the Can I Have It auction group uh, this coming weekend. So if you're not on there, get on there. It is well worth it. Um, let me show There's you an echo. what we've got here. We've got an echo going on. Sorry, I was reading through the previous <laughs> comments, so they keep trying to tell me there's an echo. Oh, let me go <laughs> check this before we move on. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I was a little tired, and I... Uh, make sure all of our microphones are on. Oh, 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 oh. Don't know why we have it, echo. Is mine too close to something? No. That one's off, that one's off, that one's off, that one's off. I honestly do not know why we would have an echo. Right now we should have an echo because the microphones are very close. Yours is on, mine is on, yours is receiving, mine is receiving. I don't know. Sarah has an echo too. Oh, ah, I know, I know. Here we go, let's try this. There, that should fix the echo. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I just had to reset all my settings. There's always one setting I forget. So hopefully, um, people will tell me in a moment here whether or not that fixed the echo. Um, so, yes. Yes, the clogs, happy yes. But let me show you the, uh, the Stanley 45. This is one that really made me happy because it comes in the original box. And so we open this up, and in here, it's got the original book and the how to use special purpose planes. Um, yeah. So we've got all of the original pieces from the 45, including the screwdriver, which everyone is looking for. Uh, the screwdrivers have a tendency to disappear. Um, it even comes with an extra set of spurs, and it comes with the full set of irons, everything in there from it. So the whole thing is in here, and I'm going to be selling that this weekend. Oh yeah, even the, uh, even the, the cam positioner which is a, a fun little thing, which mine didn't come with for a while. So part of me was like, ooh, I really want to keep this. And part of me was like, you know, it's a whole kit. Um, I already have all the parts. I have the whole kit. Do I really need to sell mine and keep this one? And my answer was, nah. So um, let's, uh, we're going to be selling this this weekend. So if you are interested in this, head on over to the Can I Have It group. And uh, oh yeah, this is interesting. Originally $47. <laughs> so, yeah, um, it's been a little while. Most of his tools were from the 80s or so. Um, so I don't know if he got that then or what. But, uh, whew, stepping on a block of wood there. So, um, let's talk about jointing. Hornet. What? <laughs> did, uh, first of all, did that fix the echo? Yes, they said that's much Good. better. No, Tom West said tool porn edition, and then it made me think of what nurse porn is. Yeah, yeah. Nurse porn's this. <laughs> nurse porn is big, juicy veins. <laughs> Which happens to be the same as vampire porn. Mm. So. <laughs> Except I'm usually looking down here, not up here. Yeah. <laughs> um, jointing a board. What is jointing a board? Basically, if you want to. It's a marriage. Boards, <laughs> Joints is what brings us together. 
if, if you want two boards to glue together this way for a tabletop or something of that nature, you want to make sure that these two joint together. You want them to be matching. Um, and so technically, it doesn't have to be perfectly straight and true, but it's kind of gotten into the idea of, well, it does need to be perfectly straight and true. So not only does it need to be straight along the edge, but it also needs to be at 90 degrees to the, uh, um, to the face all the way along it. And so how exactly do we do that? And most people immediately think they need to go and get a Stanley number eight, a jointing plane, some big, beefy, wide, long plane, and this will do the jointing for you. And without this, you cannot joint. And no, um, now this does make it nice. This is a good plane for it. This is a great plane for it. But do you need a big, long Stanley eight or seven or even a six or a five and a half? No, you don't really need those. Um, you can joint with Unless a number Unless you're telling your wife that you need something. Yes, um, <laughs> if your wife is listening, yes, that you need this. Uh, that is a requirement, so. <laughs> but no, you can actually joint with a number three. And so I want to, first off, talk through what is jointing, how does it get done, and then a couple different methods and some of the other cool things that you may or may not want um, that uh, can make life a little bit more fun. Is that a super chat? It is. Why don't you set and do that while I am doing this? This is enough of the boring talk. We want to update on Sarah's bench. Sarah, Sarah, Sarah. Ah, uh, Sarah's bench is uh, sadly lacking an update. Is is right over there. It it's, hasn't uh, really writing. changed since the video went live. Something with work and yeah. my family members not staying out of hospitals. Oh, the fun of it. You know, apparently I don't spend enough time Oops. in the medical world. More to come, hopefully this weekend, maybe. Tell James yeah, to like stop to... scuba diving so much on weekends. And Sarah <laughs> will have time to work on her bench. <laughs> Does he have a mom joke? Does he have a mom joke or do I have a mom yes. joke? Or should I start doing this while you look that up? Uh, go ahead and start. Okay. I'll look one up. So... Right now, I have this edge perfectly true and clean. It is 90 degrees to the edge, and so we are all done with this video. Um, let's move on from here. <laughs> so what happens is you, you want to get the board clean, but most of the time it's not gonna be perfectly true. So I'm gonna bring this plane in here, and I'm going to do one area here. And now I'm not taking any cuts, so there's a bit of a belly here, and I'm gonna do another bit of a belly here. And now this board is very, very untrue. If I bring this in, it lies, it is so untrue. I can look in here and I can see I've got daylight coming through here, got a little bit of daylight coming through here, but I'm touching a nice and clean here. Now the problem with that is if I try and joint it with this number three, I can still get a shaving from one end to the other. Even here where it wasn't, now I can get a shaving. And so with that, I can get a shaving all the way along. But all that did was make the low spots lower and make the high spots lower. So I put this on here, and I still will be getting light through here and getting light over here. This didn't joint the board. So in order to joint the board, I need to know where is it high. Uh, but before we do that, do you have a mom joke? We have a mom joke. Wait, Alan, here's your mom joke. What do you call a dog magician? Dog magician? Mm-hmm. What? A labracadabrador. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, let's get back to this. <laughs> it's not going to get any better from here. I'm just telling you. I'm too tired. <laughs> so if you want to joint with a small plane, you need a straight edge. Um, you can't joint without knowing where it needs to be. So what you can do is you can put this on here, and you can get down and eyeball it, and I can see I'm touching here, and I'm touching here, and I'm touching from here on back. And so what I can do with that is I can come in here and know from here to here, I need to take a shaving. And at this point, I'm just gonna lift out. I need to know right here, I need to take a shaving. Lift out, and then over here, I need to take a shaving. And normally I do that two or three times and check it again. Just make sure I'm where I want to be there and there. Yep. 
so. One, two, come over here. And I'm gonna look at it again and I'm gonna check and see where am I high. Now actually I'm low back here at the beginning. I'm touching here, still a little bit low right here. And then I'm touching all the way back here. So I'm gonna do one shaving from here to here. And then from here to here. And I'm just doing the high spots. And now I can put this on there. And now, that is well within tolerances. So I'm getting... That is really nice and clear all the way along. A couple questions about your okay. straight edge. What's that? How, well, the question of how do you make it and what did you make yours out of? <laughs> uh, this is made out of a piece of hickory. Make it as straight and clean grain as possible. Um, and then you joint it just like this. But the way to tell if it's straight without a straight edge is you put it down on a board and you draw a line along there. And then you flip it over and you draw that line. And those two lines will exaggerate into each other. And then you can see where your high spots and where your low spots are. And you put it back up and plane those high spots and low spots are. Put it down here, draw a new line, flip it over, draw another new line, and make sure that those two lines are perfectly parallel or touching each other exactly. And that way you can tell you get a nice straight edge without a straight edge. But it becomes a little bit more of annoying because you have to draw a line, draw a line, do it, draw a line, draw a line. But once you do that, you get a nice straight edge. You can put it on here. Now I do have a video on making this straight edge. So if you want to see that, go click on that. Once you have a straight edge, then you can check your straight edge. <laughs> so once you have a straight edge, you can make a straight edge. It's one of those things of uh, how do you make the tool without the tool. So now I've got this perfectly cleaned and true. And that is great. The next thing we need to do is come in here with the square and check it. Now, if you've been doing it for any amount of time, you can start to eyeball what is square and where is the rotation. You, you kind of know what you feel and, and can see it. But for most people, at this point, they're gonna put this on here and they're gonna realize, mm, my slope is leaning that way um, because I need to do something on here. But it's one of those things after learning it for a while, after getting that skill in, I can put this on here and I know that I'm clean and true all the way across because I know what it feels like and I know what it looks like by now. So on that point, now that I know it's clean and true all the way along, I can get one curl from one end to the other. And as long as I don't put any weird pressure on it at any one point or another, I know I'm still, I'm still clean and true. I know it's still jointed. I can still put this on here and I can go, yep, no light all the way along that. And so that's how you can fix leaning one way or the other, is you take a full curl from one end to the other. Once you know that it's a straight edge, now you can work on correcting that tip. And some people are going to do that by moving the lateral adjuster. So you move it to one side to try and take more material off of one or the other. That can work, but it's one of those things that you're then overcompensating, and then you come back and you overcompensate. And so I don't like adjusting it with the lateral adjuster. What I like to do is push the plane from one side to the other. So let me see if I can see this a little better. There we go, focus. There we go. So what I can do is I can put the plane on here, and if I am high on this side over here, then I'm going to put this plane on here and I'm going to lean it over to this side so I'm overhanging the opposite side. What that's going to do is it's going to naturally put more weight on this side. I'm naturally going to tip the plane this way to take off a little bit more material. If I'm high on this side over here, I'm going to slide the plane the other way. That way I'm putting more weight on the other side and it's going to take off more material off of the high spot. Wait, did I say that wrong? I said that wrong. Oh my, I'm completely saying it backwards. If I'm high on this side, I want to take the plane over here so it's overhanging the high side. Wow, total brain fart. If I'm high on this side over here, I want the plane on this side over here so that I'm overhanging the high side. I'm putting more weight onto the high side so I'm taking off more material from that side or the other. Wow, that was a, that was a, a fun mistake. <laughs> I did that in a video and someone called me out on it and 
I, I, I do it quite often that I'll, I won't realize I said something until after I've edited and uploaded the video and I go back and watch it. I'm like, I can't believe I said that. <laughs> I can. Once it's edited and uploaded, I can't do anything about it um, other than delete the video and re-upload it, which basically is suicide for the video. Um, so, mm. Okay, um, next thing we have to learn is about pressure of the plane. Now, on a small plane like this, it's not going to make that big a difference. But once you start getting up into a bigger plane, it makes a lot of difference on where you put the pressure because there's a lot more plane to put the pressure. Uh, any pertinent questions before I jump into this? Uh, no. No? Okay, cool. So, um, what we have here is a number six. It is a good bit wider than the four. It's about the size of a four and a half. Um, and it is a good bit longer. Now, the longer the plane is, the more it's going to reference the whole board. So if there's a high spot here and a high spot here, it's going to touch the high spot here and it's going to touch the high spot here and the blade in the middle and that low spot isn't going to hit anything. Whereas your plane is half the length of the board that it will join. So if the plane is 24 inches long, you can have a four foot long board. That's a rule of thumb and it, take it with a grain of salt. Um, and just like I can plane with a num I can joint with a number three, um, I can do a longer board with a number six than twice its length. But twice its length gives you an idea of how accurate it will be. And so that being said, yeah, it's a rule of thumb, but that's where rule of thumbs are not always correct. The problem with this is now I can put a lot of pressure up here in the toe, or I can put a lot of pressure down here in the heel. And if the plane comes down here off the end, now, I'm putting a lot of pressure here, the plane does this thing, and I start lopping off the end here, and I take off more material here, tip it up, is I'll be up here, and I'll have all this extra weight back here on the heel pushing down, and I'll start to round this end off. So when I'm starting the plane, I want to make sure all my weight is up here on, up on the nose, and back here my hand is pushing forward, it's not pushing down at all. So I'm going to start up here, once it's, whoop, once it's in, then we're going along, now I can put pressure on both sides. And once we get out here to this end, then I'm taking my hand off the front, and I'm just pushing with my back hand. Let me show you what that looks like. So, I get out here, and I take my hand off the front, and I'm just pushing with my back hand. All of the pressure is back here on it. I even have my wrist resting on the, the back of the plane. You also, also, also notice that I will be grabbing the plane like this and kind of letting my finger guide along it. That way I know that the plane is in the center because my finger kind of becomes the fence that it slides along. And if I want to take off more from one side or the other, then I'll pinch up on the plane so that I'm pushing it onto that side or onto the other side. So it kind of gives me my, my fence. Um, so the nice thing about this is this plane then tells me what needs to be jointed. So let's take this thing out of joint again. And we're going to come over here. And I'm going to take off several shavings here. So Brian Fulmer wants to know, do you really need a jointer fence? I'll be talking about that in a minute. Okay. So you may notice that I'm not using a jointer fence at all right now. And that's because I've gotten to the point where I can kind of eyeball it. So now I've got this low spot here and I've got a low spot here. High spot, high spot, high spot. So I'm going to grab the big honkin. Honk, honk, number eight. And with this number eight, let me back this up so you can see the whole thing. With the number eight, I can put it on here, put my weight on the front, start the plane in, and now it's not cutting here when I'm on that low spot. And then I'm cutting here again, and then it's not cutting here on that other low spot. Shift the plane to the back, so I'm just putting my weight here on the back. And now I've just taken spots off of the high spot because the toe would ride on a heel, would ride on a hill, and the heel would ride on a hill. And the blade won't cut anything in between. So I can use this to tell me when it's jointed. When I get one curl from one end to the other, then I know it's within variance. And the variance is the depth of cut that I'm making. So if I'm taking a cut of, you know, five thousandths, then I know it's out of five thousandths over 20 inches. 
Or 24 inches. Uh, almost. Almost have a curl from one end to the other. Oop. Slipped on a block of wood. There we go. So, now I got a curl all the way from one end to the other. I can grab this board up here, set it on there, and if everything is good, I shouldn't see any light coming through it. And in this case, that is spot on. Very, very happy with that one. So with that, I now know that without using the straight edge, I know it's straight because this will ride on the high spots and not cut the low spots because it's long enough to go between them. Um, the other thing we'll want to do is then come in with this, which again, who's off? No, no, just the light. And we're good and true there. Now, um, let's talk about the fence. Any questions before I change around? Um, well, we had a super chat that I don't think you can see anymore. Oh, cool. Who's it from? Tom West said, King James and Lady Sarah. Lady Sarah, queen, hello. <laughs> the White Oak depend on your help to keep the show running. Do your part and support this channel. Join their Patreon. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom. Sir Tom. Sir Tom. Yeah. Sir Tom of the White Oak. Do you have a mom joke? I do have a mom joke. Oh, wait, what's the mom joke? What do you call a lazy baby kangaroo? What? A pouch potato. <laughs> Good. I like it. I like it a lot. <laughs> so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take this out of true. Um, I'm going to just plane one corner down so that this will no longer be square to the face. So I'm going to move the lateral adjustment over. And I'm going to take off a really heavy cut on one side. That just feels bad. Oh, it feels bad. Oof, 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 that's wrong. And now I put this on here, and I am way out of square. Way out of square. So I can either trust my standards and move it over. Let me switch back to this one. I can either come back in and I can move this over because this is the high spot on this side now. I can move it over into here so I've got a lot of weight. The plane naturally wants to tip off the board. And just put that weight on there and plane in just this edge. And with how much I took off of that, I'm probably going to need to do two strokes to get rid of that. Or I could use one of these weird fangled things. Um, and this is a jointing fence. So let me show you what this does. And I'm going to, actually I'm going to put it on the 6 rather than the 8, just because the 8 is big and beefy. Um, this is one that I just got, and I've been wanting one for a long time, and these things are crazy expensive. Um, yeah, and, and I, I'm very, very happy with it. I actually got it on the Can I Have It group um, two weeks ago. Very, very pleased to finally get one. So this actually sits on here, and it's got cut-ins for the plane to sit on, as well as it registers against the sides. I can put this on here, lock that down in place, and then there are these wings that swing down and they grab, oops, swing down that way, and they grab the sidewall of the plane. So put that down, oop, came off, a little bit fiddly to get in place. Swing that down, swing that down, and we can tighten in these until it grabs that sidewall. And then it also has these set screws that come down and push the plane down into the bottom register. So that goes down in there. And now I've got a fence on here that I can adjust to whatever angle I want. And in this case, I want to make it to 90 degrees. I'm going to put this on here. And as long, um, and this is one of the things, you, a lot of people worry about making sure the side of the plane is 90 degrees to the bottom. And that really doesn't matter unless you want to use it as a shooting plane. And even then, you have a lateral adjuster. Um, and in this case, I'm just measuring this to the sole of the plane, so it doesn't matter what the sidewall of the plane is. I can put that on there, lock that in place, and then lock this down. Now, I've got a fence on here at 90 degrees to the side. Now with this, I want to make sure I'm not putting down pressure on the plane. I want to put sideways pressure to make sure that this is registering 
into the side of the board. So there's a handle on the back here that you can grab, and I like to hold it like that. Um, some people like to move the handle up to the front one. Um, I don't find that quite as comfortable. Um, I, actually, I think Stanley, the book, had it up on the front, and I don't, I don't like that. I like to grab this one up here, and then grab the knob up there. And then we're gonna set it back here, and I'm putting my fingers on this to get it started. Oop, missed my line. Okay. There you go. I have a question. Just a second. And keeping it registered on there, I'm just taking material off of this because all my pressure is against this fence. What's the question? Actually, can I can I try because I you, you can try always, this. This this one this actually takes a lot more skill. I was gonna say you always off. make it look so easy and yeah. then well then the other thing is you've got to be able to hold this thing. Okay, ignore my PJ pants and fuzzy pink slippers. Okay, so <laughs> okay. right hand. Uh, left hand up on oh the Oh my knob. gosh, so, my bench. No, not, not like that. No, I'm trying. Like this. Tall enough. There you go. And then the other one, grab right there. On this little knobby here? Yep. And have it up at your chin. I feel like I'm shooting a and gun. So the other, yeah, well, basically. And what you want to feel is that this fence is pushed against the side. Okay. Not that the plane is down. And right now it's hard because it kind of pivots on the end. Yeah. Once you get it started, then you'll be able to feel the fence back. But I'm good now, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Don't pull it! Don't pull I'm not. it! I'm just holding this aside. Hang on. <laughs> There's a thingy in my way. It's also up at your nose. This is where a size bench will come in handy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sliding everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> A lot harder than it looks. Uh -oh. Yeah, and this 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 takes a lot of skill, and this is one of the things that a lot of when you first get into it, your brain says, "Oh, having this would make it so much easier." And what it's a whole other skill to learn. Whereas you could just learn the skill of freehanding it. The skill of freehanding is a little bit harder to learn, but not that much harder. Whereas this is an easier skill to learn, but it's a very expensive tool, and it's another tool to have in the shop. And it's, it's a whole different way of planing because you have to put a pressure against the fence. Oops. Rather than putting it just straight down to the plane. And you so, do it in like three seconds, and it takes me a whole minute just. <laughs> and so, I mean. It is a great tool, it is a fun tool to have, and it's a good skill to learn. But most of these are upwards of $200 plus just for the stupid fence. Not worth it. Yeah, um, that, I mean, mo yeah, it's, it's very rare to find a fence for less than the plane that you're putting on it, you're putting it on. Um, so it's, it's one of those things that I don't generally tell people to do that. But if you wanna have a fence, or if you have a channel where you wanna show off a fence, then it's good to have one. <laughs> Wait, get me one and then we can do fencing. <laughs> and so I, I really don't, I, I, I don't see a time when I'm ever going to use a fence because I, I need it. Um, other than having a fence to show in videos because people are always asking me about the fence. Um, so yeah, I don't do that. I'm gonna come over here and I'm going to move the plane over so I'm putting more weight on the side I want to take off. And that's just so much easier. It's faster, it's simpler. Okay, two more passes. A little bit more, maybe two more now. Yeah, it's looking better. There. And now I've gotten to the point where that's what I'm looking for. And that's why I don't use a fence, because I find that to be <laughs> so much easier and faster. But I, it's, it's not to say that this isn't right or that this is wrong. 
Um, a lot of people absolutely love this, and that is the skill they have learned, and they, they really go to town on it, and if that's your thing, great. Um, and there are, um, is it Veritas, I think, that makes a new one that's a lot less expensive than the old ones? Um, so if you want that, that's a great way to go. Any questions so far? Um, I'm sure. Hang on. What's that? Give me a second. Oh, okay. All right, well, she's working on that. I'm going to talk through the next thing. So jointing one edge is great, but most of the time you want two edges to come together and you want those two to be clean. So I'm actually going to joint these two edges and they do not fit, they do not match at all. Let me see if I can show this. I was hoping I could make these small enough I could make them show up in the video. And so you can see light coming through there. And there's a few places where they touch and a few places where they don't. You can see light coming through over there. So I want to actually joint these two boards together um, because that's normally what you're, doing. you're going to make two edges fit. And there's a couple little tricks you can do to make that a little bit easier and kind of make all of this moot and not having square edges is not necessary. So, got a question before I jump into this? I think we've had a couple. Hang on. Okay. Uh, okay, I think I'm just going to go with one that's directly, and you cool. may be answering this in the next few minutes. So Harold Golden asks, could I clamp both boards together and joint them at the same time? If my angle was off a little, wouldn't both boards still go together? You're skipping the joint on me. Okay. <laughs> I figured so, that was coming. Yeah, the other so ones are more like their specific situation, so I'm saving those. Yep. So here's what we got. We want to make these two go together. But rather than jointing one board, making it true, and then jointing the other board, that is also true. And since they're both true, I know they will fit together. You can do both at the same time and then not have to worry about them being square. What you can do is clamp them together and hold them until you get a nice flush edge all the way around the top. It doesn't have to be perfectly flush. Open up the vise, squeeze it down in a little ways. Allow you to tweak it a bit before you actually lock it down in. And we're gonna oops, slide that down a little farther actually. sticking up a little bit when I actually clamp it, it kind of spreads. There, that's better. So what we've got is these two put together. And this is where I would not be able to do it with a number three because the number three isn't wide enough to cover both at the same time. Actually, it's just barely wide enough. I might be able to do it with the number three. Maybe. I'd probably grab a number four. Or I could grab a number six. Hey, check that out. The nice thing about this is I can do exactly what I've been doing before, where I'm hitting some spots. I'm going to take a little bit heavier cut than that. And it's only hitting where it's high. And I'm getting this board over here, the second board, um, before I'm getting this first board. And I want to go until I get a full length shaving from both boards. Just like that. So now when I take these two out and I flip them over, I know I have a perfect matching joint between the two because I know number one, they're straight. Oh, oh, okay. Here's a great learning experience. They're not straight. Did James make a mistake? I, I, I forgot to, to, to mention one thing, which uh, this reminds me because this is one of the problems that comes up. What I've got here, what I've got here is the exaggerated bow. And so it's touching in the middle, but you can see how it rocks from side to side. That is, that, that's something I completely forgot to mention earlier and something I forgot about. So yeah, that's a great learning experience. How many times you this, forgot? This will eliminate valleys, but it will not eliminate hills. So this is actually riding up and over this hill from one side to the other. So let's put this back in here. Nice and true. Lock it down. And now what we're going to do is rather than taking one curl all the way from one end to the other, we're going to start here in the middle. And we're going to take light passes from the middle until it stops cutting.
Okay, now I'm not taking anything from here in the middle. So I'm gonna back it up a little bit. I'm gonna take it from like here to here until it's not cutting. Oh, here, let me purposely move that over. I'm gonna purposefully move the lateral adjuster over so I'm putting a slight slant on the board so these are not square to the top, uh, square to the face. Almost there. There. Now I'm not taking a cut here in the middle. So now I've got a bit of a, a belly. And a jointer will always Don't get rid of the belly. Don't talk about yourself that way. <laughs> <laughs> A jointer will be able to get rid of a belly. It can't always get rid of a hill unless you do that. And so a lot of times with boards, I'll make sure I remove the middle section first, turn it into that valley, and now I'm gonna come back here and grab a full length shaving. Just like that. One full length shaving all the way across, and that will get rid of the hill on either end. So I'm gonna pull this out. Now, I can put it in here, and I know I've got a perfect joint. Actually, now there's a little bit, tiny little gap here in the middle. So I still had an ever so slight valley, but the nice thing about having a valley is you can do a sprung joint or you can clamp it together. And when I mean a valley, I mean like three or four thousandths of an inch. Just a, a tiny bit of light coming through in the middle. And that's well within the space of a clamp squeezing it out. Um, and so I would have no problem with doing that. Although I might flip it back over and do one more pass where I put a little bit of pressure at one end and a little bit of pressure at the other end to get rid of it. But that's, you know, within the shaving thickness that I was taking out. So that gives us that. Now, the interesting thing about this is this board is not square. I don't know if you can see that. But it is out of square. But this joint fits, and these boards are flat together. And that is because... They're not flat together that way. I turned the board. There we go. They're flat together that way. Um, and what happened was, if I'm taking an angle out of this board, I'm also taking the exact same angle out of this board. And they're complementing angles. So they match each other. So when I bring this back over, the two angles go together and it's a perfect joint. So if you're having problems getting that nice and true and square, joint up both boards at the same time and then you don't have to worry about it being square. You just need it to be straight. And the two angles will match against each other. So that was one of those, one of those cool things. Um, any questions before I jump on? No, we'll, I think we're going to catch them all at the end. OK. What time is it? Uh, 40. 8.39. Cool. Um, trying to remember what I, because I've missed some things in here. Oh. Yeah, that's why. At this point, I was going to be talking about, now this will do a valley, and this will clean a valley up, but it won't clean a hill. I had that mixed in there. That's kind of nice. <laughs> um, so the, the biggest question I, mean, I usually get on this one is, do I need to go get a 6, a 7, and an 8? And the answer is, is no. You don't need any of them. You can do all of this with just a number 4. Uh, a number four can joint, a number four can smooth, a number four can do all of it. And that's why a lot of people refer to the, the seven, oops, I ran my blade in it, uh, excuse me, they refer to the five as a jack plane. It's a little bit longer. You can actually joint decent boards with this. This is well within the length of jointing these boards. It's, you know, twice the length of the plane. So I can joint a, uh, a three foot long board or a four foot long board with, with a number five and still be relatively accurate. But it's still short enough, I can still do some smoothing with this. And so that's why it's the jack plane. It's kind of like the jack of all planes. So between the four and the five, usually I would go with the four because I can smooth a little bit easier than I can with this. And if I'm adjointing things, I'm gonna be using a straight edge anyways. But if I'm gonna be doing a lot of bigger projects, I might tell people, yeah, go with the five. It's gonna be a little better. You really don't need all the other planes until you start getting into woodworking, and then you really need all the planes. <laughs> so there's a, there's a couple other sizes in here that often get referred to as a jointer plane. I have the five and a half. Here, let me show you. 
the five and a half, the six, and the seven are all the same thickness. They're all the same as a, as a four and a half as well. Um, and so you can use the blades uh, from any of them. But they're all different lengths. The five and a half is actually a little bit longer than the five, not by much, by a little bit. And then they get longer and longer and longer. And so do you need each one? No, if you have a four or five, and then you get a jointer, you really don't need all the other ones other than sometimes they feel good. I almost never use my five and a half and six. They are very, very rarely used in, actually, I have never actually used the six. I sharpened it today for the first time. Um, I was actually surprised about that. I thought I had used it at least once or twice. I'd never used the six. I sharpened it today, which was like, whoa, okay. But uh, then we have the number eight. And the number eight is even wider than these. And the big reason for that is so you can dual joint bigger boards. Um, this will very, very comfortably joint two boards that are full inch thick and still have some leeway. You can joint two inch thick boards with these, but you have to be very careful. If it moves off the side, then you're not cutting out. This is wide enough that that board is, is very comfortable with. With this, you could actually joint, uh, you could almost joint two two by fours side by side, not quite, um, but close to it. And it's also the longest plane. So this will give you your longest reference surface. But with all that, this thing is incredibly heavy. And so that's why most people actually prefer the seven. It's a good comfortable weight. It's heavy enough to move, but light enough you can move it around. Uh, it's long, it's, it's not that much shorter. It's only two inches shorter than the eight. Um, as the seven is kind of the, the comfortable butter zone that most people like for jointing. But eventually, if you have a four or five and a seven, you're gonna want an eight because you six. And you're getting so close, you might as well get the five and a half to complete the set. And well, that's how things go. <laughs> so uh, that's about what I wanted to talk through on jointer planes, but I know we have a lot of other questions because um, there are always some questions that come up. So if you have any questions, throw those in the chat. We'll get to as many as we can tonight. They're saying your first investment in the, your tool shop should be headphones for when you're listening to lives. When James says that you, <laughs> you don't need the tool. What is it? Jedi mind trick? This is not the tool you're looking for. <laughs> Come on. No, you just build a tool wall and then you have to fill it. That's James's mentality. Yeah, I picked up another eight and seven this week, so I'll be selling those ones here soon. So if anyone really wants them. <laughs> and that, that's what I, I usually do, like with the, the, the set that I picked up. Um, I buy it and I tell the people, I'm going to give you a horrible price on this. Um, but what I do is I sell off the key valuable items in there. So I, I tell people if it's worth $1,000, I'm going to give you 30%. I'll give you 300 bucks for it. And I'm going to sell off the tools to make back money I put into it. And then with all of that, there's always a bunch of other things. There is the, the, the late model Stanley. There's the, the, the Craftsman hand plane. It's still a good plane, but no one really wants it. There's the brace and bits. There's all sorts of other tools that a lot of beginner tool, beginners are working, looking for. And so I keep all of those to then give away to people who are getting into the woodworking who don't have a whole lot of money. And a lot of things that I already picked up, I've already found people who, uh, uh, who could use them. And so that's, that's why I end up buying tools to sell them. I very rarely make money on that, um, but I end up then giving away a lot of other things to other people. So, that's, uh, so if you know of someone who is interested, don't send me messages of, oh, I could really use that because, you know, but if, if I hear someone is, is interested or is, is looking for something specific and doesn't have the money for it, then it's a chance I can help people out. So, fun opportunities. Uh, what, what questions we got? All right, so these are more of a collection of things. And if you've answered them in the process and I didn't catch it, sorry. Cool. All right, so David said, how can I get an inexpensive jointer plane? Cheapest Amazon one is $100. Cheapest antique from description links is about $250. Um, you can find antiques for under $80. Bucks. Um, yeah, like there was one on the, uh, the Can I Have It group last week that sold for, I think, $80. I think it was a number seven. Um, most of the MWTCA meets, um, like my number eight, I paid 60 bucks for that. 
Um, my six, I paid 50 bucks for it. I got those at MWTCA meets. Um, so there, that's usually the route to go. Um, what I would often say is if you are looking for something like that, put a post in one of the woodworking groups and say, hey guys, I'm looking for a number seven. I don't care if it's something I have to fix up a bit. Uh, I'm just looking for something for a, a, a decent price. Um, or you know, just say, I'm looking for a six, seven, or eight something if the joiner is my first one. Um, you'll, you'll find a few people like, yeah, I got one that could use some work on it. I'll sell it to you for 50 bucks. Um, so that's, that's a pretty common way to go. What's next? Let's see, Kenny and Janet Horn, um, two for one question. Question number one, if using a number five with a cambered iron, how does that affect keeping the, a the edge square? Um, okay, that's, yeah. Okay, there's, there's a whole question that because then there's the whole argument of should I camber the irons? And 99% of the time my answer is don't, don't camber on irons. It takes more work to camber it and it's going to give you an untrue surface um, there's there's no reason to to camber it unless you're talking about it like a scrub plane like I have my number five that I turned into a scrub plane it's got a big camber on it I wouldn't use that for jointing I'd put another plane in, another iron in it that's square and joint with that um, so yes if you are jointing with a cambered iron you're gonna end up with an edge that does doesn't match or work as well um, so don't put a camber on it um, now that being said, some people will um, hit the, the corners and round the corners just a little bit, have it flat on the bottom around the corner so they don't get plane tracks. Um, I don't do that because um, I just haven't had much reason to do that. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the, the pretty common one. Don't, don't camber your jointer. And there was a whole school of thought that, that said you should camber your jointer and most of the arguments for it just don't make much sense to me. And I'm sure there's quite a few people watching who do camber their jointing irons. Um, great, go for it, but my advice is uh, no. <laughs> okay, for those of us new to woodworking, what does it mean to camber Ah, cambering iron? the iron is, uh, let's see, we got an iron here. And let me flip this around. So the iron right now on this is square. So let's focus this to, so right now this iron is perfectly square or cross. And so what a cambered iron is, is actually rounded. So rather than being flat across there, it's low on this side, low on this side, and high in the middle. So there's actually a bit of rounding to it. And usually it's a very, very minute in that this is sticking up like five thousandth more than these. Um, but still, that's, that's, that's an edge difference, so I don't know why doing that. Plus it's very hard to actually maintain that. It's very hard to sharpen that. Um, and Personally, the reason I think that people do that is they find a lot of old irons in old planes that have been cambered and they think, ooh, they used to camber them back then. And most of the time that was an accidental from hand sharpening. Um, just like a lot of irons are rounded on the bevel, rather than having a perfectly flat bevel, there's an ever so slight rounding from the, the rocking motion of the hands while sharpening. Um, that's just my personal opinion on that. But yeah. So you don't camber any of your planes? I do not camber anything other than the scrub plane. I keep them all flat and true. Okay, that answered the second question. Uh, let's see, James Crandall, what did you ask? So I'm making a box for my wife's passport holder. I'm having a really hard time jointing a board about three eighths inch thick. Any suggestions? Mm, yes, and then at that point, what you end up doing is you're getting a thin board so the plane is tipping as it goes down the board and it's very hard to keep it on there. Um, and so that's why I will grab the front of the plane, um, flip around to this, and so when I'm planing, I'm actually going to grab the front and put my finger in there. And if I really need a lot of balance, I'll actually put my whole hand in there to feel the board, and it will let me know if my plane starts tipping one way or the other. Um, now if the board's really short, I only have space for a knuckle or two to fit in there. Just having that little bit of, of, of tactile feeling on the board lets you know if the plane starts to tip one way or the other. Um, and so for thinner boards, get a smaller plane. And jointing with a small plane, the, the nice thing about this is it's light. It's much easier for your wrist to, to do my, minute adjustments. If you're trying to do it with a big plane, you're doing a lot of balancing um, on your wrist and it's very, it becomes more difficult to, to actually do that. Um, so usually those are, that's my big tip for thin stuff is um, feel it with your finger, give yourself that natural fence so you can, you can feel and adjust. Um, and after time you'll You'll, you'll build that muscle memory that knows that this is flat. 
Um, i trying to think if there's anything else particularly to that. Um, I do know some people who will joint um, thin stock with like a 78 rabbit plane that has a fence on it. Um, I, I've heard people really like doing that. I personally have never tried it, so I don't know. <laughs> but that might be worth trying. It might be something you like because there's a fence on there that you can push against and make it feel much like you know, a jointing fence. So, dot dot. What's next? Oh, James Crandall just super chatted. Oh, ah, thanks, James. For answering his question. Um, hang on. I got a joke. I think my chat has stopped working. You broke your chat. I broke my chat, so I don't get to see what's coming. Okay, you ready? Yes, I'm you ready. You ready for me to have a joke for an eight-year-old boy? <laughs> you ready? Best. What do you call someone that doesn't fart in public? Dead? No, dads fart in public. <laughs> no, it's a private tutor. <laughs> <laughs> In the diving world, we have, uh, there are two types of people. Those who pee in their wetsuits and those that lie. <laughs> We're just slowly, quickly. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. What's, what's next? a question? All right. This is from much earlier in the chat. Um, Pyroclast asked, why do almost all woodworkers use wooden mallets instead of rubber mallets? Is it better force delivery, potential for scuffing, tradition? Um, a wooden mallet will give you a far better energy transfer than, than rubber. Um, see, what happens is the rubber will deform, and so you're actually using up a good bit of energy into making the rubber deform and getting that softer feeling. It's the same thing with the dead blow mallets, having the, 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 the BBs inside. You actually get less energy transfer from the dead blow mallets. They feel good because they stop at the end and it makes you feel like you really transferred more, but you're actually putting a lot of your energy into two smaller impacts, which are less than one solid impact. So you're actually losing energy from it. Um, but having a good traditional jointers mallet with a well beaten in face gives you a very solid energy transfer between them. Um, so yeah, that's one of the reasons why you, you generally use wooden faces. Um, I know some carving people like to use rubber mallets um, because they give you, um, because they're, they're, they're softer on the chisels, less chance you're gonna be beating up a chisel. Um, and they're a little bit quieter, so you're doing that whole day long, tap, 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 it's just a little bit easier in the ears. Um, but most woodworkers prefer a, a solid face. So what's next? Well, Steve Combs just super chatted. And said, Mom, joke time, please, Sarah. <laughs> Thanks, apparently, Steve. apparently the jokes tonight are... So everyone's tuning in tonight for Sarah and not me, but that's okay. <laughs> as long as you super chat, I guess. <laughs> What's he well, got? I was going through my jokes and I'm like, okay, think like an eight-year-old. Think like an eight-year-old. No offense. <laughs> no offense. <laughs> but... <laughs> offense taken. It's okay. <laughs> what do you call an injury... Um, to your elbow while digging for gold. What? A minor injury. Oh. <laughs> I yes. almost dropped my phone. <laughs> <laughs> What's next? <laughs> Brian says 200 people watching. Of course, it's for Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's see. Now, Harold Golden asked this question, but I think you answered it. It was, how do you tell a difference between a number four and a number six plane? Um, there's a number on it. <laughs> no, well, here, let me. Uh, I, let I heard you talking about here. the six, but I didn't get the full context. Oh, here, let me, let me show you. I have actually several videos where I go through the whole numbering system, but let me actually let's just let's just do that. Let's go through the numbering system. I got them all down. Might as well use them all. Here, okay. So we've got a number three. Let me focus on these actually. So a number three. Excuse me, a number two. Very very short. You know, it's, it's about the size of your hand um, and very small, so it's a very thin iron. So then we move up to the number three. Number three is a good bit longer um, and also a good bit wider. And then we go up one more to the number four. 
Number four is about the same length, just a little longer, but a bit wider. And the number four is kind of the, the general standby that has become the standard plane. Very closely followed by the number five. The number five, you get this really big jump. And the number five is a much, much longer plane. So it's, it's, a, it's a, a decent step up. It's the exact same width as the number four. It's just a longer plane. This has kind of become the jack plane because it's long enough you can use it as a jointing plane, but thin enough and still short enough you can smooth with it. So it's kind of that butter zone. So the butter zone is usually either the four or the five depending upon what you do. So then you can go up to the number six, not the five, uh, the six. And the six is, again, another big leap forward in length, plus the sixth is a good bit wider. Well, for some people, the six isn't quite long enough, so they jump up to the number seven. And the number seven is just a little bit longer than the six. It's about four inches longer, um, but it's the exact same width as the six. And then you've got the number eight, which, oh, I put that one away. The number eight is only two inches longer than the seven, so it's not that much longer. But again, it's wider than the number seven. And so you have the one through eight, and then they came along and said, well, you know what? I like the number four, but I want it to be a little wider. So we want to make another plane, but we don't have another number, so we're going to stick it in between. It's the four and the half, four and a half. And the four and a half is just a little bit longer than the four, but it's also a good bit wider. And then they said, you know, we really, really like, we like the five, but we want it to be halfway between because if a lot of people like the four and a lot of people like the five, and they want, they kind of think that's like the butter zone for general use, what if we go with a five and a quarter? Five and a quarter is a, a decent bit smaller than the, the five. It's a little bit longer than the four, it's kind of halfway between the four and the five, but it's the same width as the four. Oh, excuse me, it's the same width as the, the three, not the same width as the four. So it's, it's slightly thinner than the four. And then there is the five and a half, which is just a little longer than the five in length, but it is the same width as the six and seven and the four and a half. Um, but because they made this after they made the eight and they wanted to get it in there, they just made it down to a five and a half. So there's all the number sizes. Okay, so they want me to hold a two and an eight. Oh, okay, here, eight and two. <laughs> eight? Yeah, let's put that in the right hand. Can you do that one handed? <laughs> you try the two. I do it one handed. <laughs> but to die. <laughs> <laughs> the two is not, well, it's in my left hand. That almost yeah, that's, that's your hand tight. size. Okay, here, hang on. I want to hold this two for just a second in my right hand. So would you put your pinky out? No, no. You always, uh, on all planes, you put your pointer finger out. I can see armor. Planes and saws put the hand finger out. See, this like just doesn't fit for me. That's, just, that's the perfect size. That's your hand size. So usually you're, you're pointing where you're, you're planning. <laughs> it's plain to see. So I'm missing the number one. Someday I will get a number one. But uh, unfortunately I told my wife what they cost. So it's going to be a while. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> Uh, let's see, how many questions do we have left? One. One? Okay, let's leave the one last one. We'll wrap it up. So Dennis Miko asks, if I'm going to make a scrub plane out of an old number four, do I file the mouth open, and which side should I plane, front or back? Which side should I plane? Uh, I'm just reading the question. Um, I think you're talking about the oh, the mouth, front or back. Um, yes, uh, you'll want to open up the, the mouth because you're going to have big chips coming through there. Um, and a lot of number fours, if you back the frog up, you might have enough space. But you, if you want to file the mouth bigger, you use a file to open up the front of the mouth, not the back. Um, because the frog only has so, so, so much movement back and forth. So if you file out the front of the mouth, then that gives you a larger space for chips to come through. So yes. And if you want to see that, I have a whole video on um, turning a junk plane into a scrub plane and cambering the iron. So that's a, that was a fun one. 
So that is the only plane you camber? Yes, so the scrub, scrub plane. plane. Okay. Yep. See, I was listening. You were. I was listening. <laughs> So on that note, I think we've had a little bit of fun tonight. Um, if you have any thoughts or ideas for the future, let us know. Um, I think next week is our Q&A. Is it our Q&A? What's that? Okay. Normally it would have been this week, but I had uh, a couple of people asking me to do this one this week, so we'll do this one. So uh, looking forward to next week. And if you do have any questions that I didn't get to, feel free to send me a message, and I'll try and answer those. I'll Huge thanks to all the Knights of the White Oak who joined us tonight. And I think they'll do it. So until next time, have a wonderful day. Hang on. I'm hanging. Goodbye. Holding. <laughs>